Welcome to the N1 Fitness Podcast. I'm your host as always, Marcus Sidhu, and today we've got Dr. Mike T. Nelson back on the show. So Dr. Mike is here to talk about marijuana, CBD, and traumatic brain injury. So we're going to be delving into specifically what to do after obtaining a TBI, nutrition, exercise, sleep, and supplement-wise. We're also going to be looking at the difference between CBD and THC, how Sativa Indica and Ruteralis actually originally got their names, whether marijuana is more potent now than it was in the past, and some of the different delivery methods we can use if we do choose to use something like CBD or marijuana. We're also going to be delving into CBD and how it may potentially impact inflammation, appetite, and libido. So enjoy this one. Let's get right into it. Mike, thanks for coming back on the pod, man. I'm excited for our chat. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you, Thank you for having me back. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. So folks in the industry know you best as being the metabolic flexibility guy, which we chatted about in episode 22 of the pod the last time you were on. So people want to check that out. But what inspired you to delve into learning more about CBD specifically? Yeah, so it was CBD. I looked at... Probably almost maybe three and a half, four years ago. I can't remember, but it was quite a while ago. Um, so I do a fair amount of kiteboarding. And I was looking in the research and I'm like, huh, I'm going to do this crazy sport. And especially if I'm going to do, you know, more jumps and do waves and stuff like that. You know, if I'm 20 to 25 feet up in the air and I screw something up and get dropped out of the sky like a sack of potatoes. Yeah, I wear a helmet and stuff like that. But is there something nutritionally I should be doing? Is there something exercise wise I should be doing? So on the nutrition side, I started looking at the research, and I'm also a faculty member at the Kerrig Institute, where they do basically clinical neurology, kind of used to be called functional neurology. And so I was at least briefly familiar with some of the work they did. I had a functional neurologist all lined up. I had already seen him, got a baseline, all that kind of stuff. On the nutrition side, I kept reading research and, you know, good stuff on fish oil, creatine, maybe curcumin, and different things on cannabinoids and CBD kept kind of popping up, and even THC. At the time, I was like, ah, oh, I don't know. This just seems like a load of bunk. There can't really be anything um, to this. So I kept researching it more and more. And probably about a year and a half-ish ago, I kind of popped my head up from the research and did a few presentations on it, maybe starting two years ago. And all of a sudden, like a year and a half ago, especially in the U.S., like CBD just started showing up like everywhere. And it was like just this kind of major thing, which was kind of surprising to me. And now, fast forward even more time, it's it's hard for the consumer because if on the outside, if I just got dropped into the planet and looked around and went, oh my God, either CBD cures, quote unquote, everything, my hair will regrow back, all my sexual issues will disappear, I may even get jacked and tanned from taking it or who knows what. Um, so that's either true or it's just a whole bunch of snake oil and it doesn't do anything. And the reality is, yay, kind of somewhere in the middle. I mean, there are some, we'll talk about some very specific things I think CBD can be beneficial for. Uh, most of the claims are way uh, oversold. But it, there's, I think, enough data, in my biased opinion, that you can't just toss all of it out and go, ah, oh, it's just completely worthless, never use it, ah, there's no benefit there. Uh, which, again, makes it harder because you're talking about a more complex story. I'm sure like most of the questions you get are like, oh, is CBD good or bad? It's like, well, it's not really good or bad. It's just what are you trying to do and the kind of harder conversation to have that can't be just wrapped up in. Oh, it's just completely, it's the greatest thing ever. Just take it all the time, you know, bathe in it, do whatever you want. Or no, it's just completely worthless. Like never worry about it. And the answer is kind of in between. That uh, makes a ton of sense, like most things for sure. Yeah. Now, what exactly is CBD and then how does it differ from THC? Because I think it's easy to confuse yeah. those two just being that marijuana contains them both. Right. So both THC, so tetrahydrocannabinol, is the main psychoactive component of cannabis or marijuana, right? And most people who've ever used it will realize that pretty fast. Um, CBD is actually non-psychoactive. Uh, you maybe super, super high doses. There's one study that came out that maybe some converts to THC in the gut. Who knows? But that's like a ridiculously high dose. But for all practical purposes, it's non-psychoactive. So initially, if you go all the way back in time, uh, like some of the guys at Charlotte's Web, they had a specific strain of cannabis that was called Charlotte's Web. And initially, it was called the hippie's disappointment. 
because you would smoke it and you're like, ah, this is just ditch weed. Like nothing happens. It's just ah, horrible. Never use it because the THC content was very, very low. Now, fast forward, we have some good data on CBD. Uh, the main thing that it's used for, it's actually approved as a drug in the U.S. by the FDA uh, called Epidiolex. So Epidiolex is from GW Pharmaceuticals. Is literally just high dose CBD. It's primarily used to treat epilepsy, and there's some very good data showing that uh, again, treatment rates are not 100, percent but probably much better than any other drug that that we've seen. Uh, ketogenic diets have obviously been used for that too. Look up stuff from the Charlie Foundation. Um, so that's the the main thing. Is CBD is a non psychoactive component. Uh, THC is the other main component. And then below that in cannabis, there's, man, I think well over 100 different cannabinoids now. I can't remember if it's 113 or 133, something like that. There's well over 100 different cannabinoids. On top of that, there's all different compounds called terpenes. So if you've ever smelled cannabis, it smells like, oh, it smells like lemons. Oh, it smells like bad diesel fuel. You know, it has all these weird different smells to it. And those are actually from the terpenes, which show up in nature and all sorts of other different compounds, too. Um, so there's a whole myriad of different compounds that are actually in the entire plant. Uh, by volume, in most, the highest is going to be uh, THC and CBD, but there's a bunch of other uh, smaller compounds that show up also. Now, I was talking to a guy who was in the weed industry, and he lived in Portland, funny enough, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, and he good. was saying that the terpenes actually play a part in getting you high. Is that true? They're, they're responsible for some of that high that you feel. I would say yes and no. Um, the, here's where it gets really confusing, right? So, okay, so you walk into most you know stores where it's legal or if you're in a country that's legal. Um, in the U.S., usually they're like, hey, what are you trying to do? You know, like, ah, oh, I'm trying to sleep better at night. Ah, oh, bro, you need this, you know, high indica strain. Or, ah, oh, you know, I'm just trying to help maybe with pain a little bit. I, I need to use it during the day. I don't want to be sleepy. Ah, oh, bro, you need this, like, super high, you know, sativa blend. Right. So normally they'll split between what's called a sativa and an indica. And yes, those plants do look a little bit uh, different. Um, but if you look at where the kind of folklore from that came from, it was primarily from looking at the plant. Right. So if you have a more sativa type plant, the leaf structure is different. They tend to grow much higher. They tend to be a little bit more spread out overall. So the folklore was, oh, that uplifts you and makes you, you know, feel better because a plant grows real tall and that type of thing. Uh, indica type plants tend to be more bush looking, different structure, different color. They tend to be much lower to the ground, much more kind of squatty looking type of plant. So the folklore was, oh, that's just keeping you closer to the ground and, you know, kind of milling you out, that type of thing. Um, so, you know, if you now what we know, right, so the first time that uh, cannabis sativa was kind of coined as a name. Uh, I was a big guy named, I think it was David Fuchs, F-U-C-H-S. <laughs> okay. and, like in the 1500s, I think. And the translation was for, you know, basically uh, cultivated uh, cannabis. So it was a plant that you would grow on purpose. Um, so now if we look at genetic testing, there's all fancy ways of looking at it. Everything is a hybrid. Like, you cannot get 100% sativa, you can't get 100% indica. So that in and of itself makes it confusing as to what is what. And then now to go a step further, and you'd say, okay, I want to do this analytical chemistry test because I need to know exactly what's in this, this plant, and I think this is a high amount of sativa. Cool. I can run it through all sorts of fancy organic chemistry testing, but I need a pure 100% sativa sample to compare it to. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm looking at because it's all done by a, a comparison. And those 100% samples just don't exist, right? So from a comparison standpoint, just based on that species or subspecies, I should say, we can't really do it. Um, now, there is some truth to that, which makes it harder because the different profiles of the terpenes, the other compounds in it, or what's called the chemovar profile, they do tend to be different between a more sativa-dominant plant and a more indica-dominant plant. So we don't really know, is that really the plant? Or my guess is it's probably more these subcompounds, these terpenes, the amount of CBD, the amount of THC, um, all the different cannabinoids, CBN, everything else, 
that those probably do play a big role in how you feel. And we do have some very good data on that. Different terpenes that have kind of a, a lemon type smell. There is some basic data showing that they are tend to be a little bit more kind of uplifting and not as much a depressant. Uh, some of the other terpenes that are responsible in more of an indica plant, I think the muscarine is one of them. Uh, that's the one that's kind of responsible for what's called the couch lock. If you've uh, ever done too much of a certain kind, you feel like you literally just kind of get stuck to your couch cushion or so I hear. Um, we know that those tend to be good for people who have more muscle pain and that type of thing. And it is actually having a relaxing, almost a paralytic effect on the muscle. Um, the hard part is, like I said, all of these are showing up in all different compounds. So to me, the future is most of the time now in better places. You can request what is the, the what's called a chemovar profile. So there's different analytical companies that will do this now. And they'll show you, okay, here's your THC, here's your CBD, here's CBN, here's like the main terpene profile. And on some of them, they'll say, okay, if you have a high amount of these terpenes, you may see uh, this particular type of effect. So I think it's getting to the point where it's becoming a little bit more, unfortunately, complicated, but I think it has to get complicated to some degree. And that allows you then to kind of compare, right? Because the other really confusing thing is, you can't really go by the names either because a lot of the names and the tracking of it are just kind of made up. Does it kind of get you in the ballpark? Yeah, but I think you want to look at more what is the direct kind of profile of it. And at least then if they get in a new batch or they can't get what they had before, you're like, hey, I know I did analytically N of one pretty good on this. It kind of has this profile here. Do you have anything else that's similar to that profile? So I think it allows you to kind of do a more direct comparison than based off of actual data instead of, you know, whatever the guy in the back was smoking and what he felt like, I guess. <laughs> yeah, man, fair enough. That's fascinating. So as far as the different strains, would it be fair for folks to think about it almost like ethnicity? Like nobody is 100 percent X ethnicity. We're all sort of mixed to some degree. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and it, like I said, if you go back in time, it's debatable. Was there even ever a hundred percent, you know, strain of anything? Right? No one really knows because it's it's all split out over different areas, uh, different parts of the world. Uh, in the cannabis plant, much like if you were getting coffee or tea or wine, also will vary depending upon the area it's grown in, the climate the wind, right? So if you stress the plant more, um, you will actually see higher amounts of some of these terpenes and other compounds potentially. Just like in grapes, if, you, if you're a winemaker, you kind of want to stress them a little bit, but you don't want to kill them, right? Because you get a different uh, profile from it. Um, so that also makes it a little bit hard. But yeah, I would agree. It's kind of just a, a range and the name, if anything, is kind of a rough ballpark, uh, maybe to get you in there. And Hopefully in the future we'll have more kind of direct data on what that is. Because even if I come and say, hey, this has got the super high terpene amount, the THC is X, CBD is, is Y, there's not a lot of direct studies that have even looked at what are the effects of that exact profile. You know, most of the studies are looking at just baseline uh, CBD. Some of the early studies looking at exercise performance in cannabis literally didn't even spec how much THC was in it. You know, like give, you know, subjects one rolled joint measured what happened to them afterwards, you know. It's like, who knows what that means. A but, bunch of stoners were probably carrying out those studies too. So. <laughs> yeah, and it was done like in the 70s. So at the time, nobody knew anything, you know. So was that a step forward? Absolutely. Uh, but now where we're at, I think, the, yeah, getting more direct data will be useful. And the reality is it makes the consumer's life easier, right? Because if they move, they go to a different country, they go somewhere else. I know Amsterdam is very big on trying to push this over just strain names. It gives you some data to try to figure out what's going to be best uh, for you and what you're trying to do. Very cool, man. Now, I used to partake in the, the marijuanas a lot, and sure. I used to be able to, you know, smoke a whole joint on my way to school, go to class, be fine. My tolerance, having said that, was a lot higher at that point in my life. I rarely, if ever, sure. smoke now. but. I swear marijuana is stronger nowadays than it was before on a percentage of THC basis. Is that true? 100%. Yeah, because especially in the U.S., uh, I can't speak to other countries, but 
In U.S., because right now, as it's recording, um, cannabis is still considered a Scheduled One drug. Now, people listening in, obviously, different states have voted and said, screw you, we don't care, we're going to make it legal. You know, Colorado being one of the first one, Washington, Oregon. Now there's a whole bunch of other states for both medical and uh, recreational use. But if you go back to when it was kind of more of a black market, if you got caught with a large amount and were potentially going to be prosecuted as a distributor, uh, it still was considered a scheduled one drug. So from a scheduling standpoint, it's in the same class as uh, heroin, meth, uh, literally cocaine is a scheduled two. So to be a scheduled one drug means that you have to have a very high risk for dependency, which it doesn't. Is there a risk of dependency? Absolutely. Is it super high risk? Not really. Um, and two, no medical use, which they've had Marinol approved as a synthetic THC compound since the 90s, right? So they've kind of already gone uh, against that. Uh, but even cocaine, like I said, is a Schedule two drug because it's used to numb the nose in ENT procedures. <laughs> <laughs> so even something like cocaine is still considered a Schedule II um, drug. So if you go back, because of that scheduling, the, the prosecution potentially could be very high because of the way it is. And if you're going to get caught, it was to your advantage because it's done by weight. Like how many pounds did you have? If you can breed and get a higher and higher percentage of THC, from a business standpoint, that's probably a benefit to you, right? Because like, ah, go to this, you know, Weird guy in the corner, bro, he's got stronger weed, right? You know, that's kind of a, a selling tactic. And if you got busted, they weren't really running analytical chemistry tests to see, you know, what percentage it was and based anything off of that. It's how much volume of the material did you have. So there's this very big push to get higher and higher and higher percentages of THC. Um, so now you go in, you can routinely get 18, 19, 20 percent or higher, which is way higher than it ever was 10, 15 years ago. And the, my bias is the next trend is actually that's going to change and slowly start to come down, right? Because a lot of people now want something that is very high in CBD, maybe high in these other terpenes compounds. But if they're especially using it for medical use under their physician, they may not want super high levels of THC. You know, sometimes that doesn't go well for, for people. So I think for medical use now we're trying to see they're trying to get strains that are a little bit lower in THC and maybe higher in some of the other compounds. Okay, cool. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Now, as far as CBD goes, what are some of the different forms in which folks can take this stuff? So what sort of delivery yeah. methods are we looking at? Yeah, so by the FDA as of this recording, the only delivery method that is legal across most states uh, for CBD which, again, the FDA just passed a whole bunch of interesting stuff to see if CBD even remains legal, but as of this recording, it is. Um, however, that's only in a tincture and in a suspended oil. Now, you will find um, other preparations that are kind of transdermal or kind of rub on your skin type thing. You have to be kind of careful with some of the claims that are made. But right now, the only thing available, or I should say legal in the FDA eyes, is a tincture as an oil that you would put in your mouth. And that has to be orally available. Uh, that's kind of the general rule for pretty much all supplements. Now, again, you know, you've been around long enough to see supplement industry do all sorts of crazy, interesting stuff from, you know, spray on, you know, pro hormones back several years ago to ephedra to all sorts of things. We can talk later if we think the FDA did the right or wrong thing in terms of legality of those. However, uh, that's the only legal method. Now, if you get into states where medical marijuana is legal, it gets to be even more of a gray area. So now cannabis can be sold uh, medically, and then you can look at percentages of CBD to THC in that. And then you have options of just you know directly smoking it, like in a joint. You have options where you can put the dry, the herb itself, in like a vaporizer, like something called like a grasshopper makes one. Uh, you can get a reduction in an oil. Right, So if you want to use a vape pen or something like that, uh, those would be the other options with those. Again, the downside with that, I know there's a lot of backlash against vape pens and all that kind of stuff right now. <clears throat> if you look at a lot of the unfortunate side effects that have happened, a lot of those are from black market, what they call carts or cartridges. Um, in general, I'm inherently very distrustful of any oils. I think it's very convenient, but I would 
I would spend a fair amount of time doing a lot of research to see what the company is putting into it, what are they extracting. Because if it's an oil and they just whack you with a bunch of THC, you wouldn't really ever know what else is in there, right? And that's the hard part about the whole industry is there's a, a big monetary incentive, although I'd say it's highly unethical, to maybe cut some corners and do other things because acutely it's maybe not going to affect your, your margins. Um, so I'm in general not super trustful of oils. I'm sure there's companies that are doing it well, uh, but you'd have to investigate that. If people go more the medical route, vaporizing may be a little bit better uh, in terms of inhalation of other carcinogens, possibly. There's not a lot of data to support that, though, surprisingly. Um, so I think burning it directly is going to be okay. Um, the other nice part, if you vaporize it, you can control the temperature. So the temperature at which you <clears throat> vaporize it can change the different compounds and where they come out. So if you look up what's called the boiling point or kind of the vaporization point of different compounds, uh, they're different. So if you want something where you don't want a lot of THC and you want to try to get more of these terpenes and other possible cannabinoids, depending on which one you look at, you can actually vape it at a lower temperature because um, THC comes out at a much higher temperature point. Now, that's going to co not completely going to eliminate THC, but it's definitely going to reduce it even if THC is present in the compound, the plant itself. Now, the downside with that is and people are like, oh, well, can I do that for CBD? Can I get to a temperature where I get mostly CBD and not THC? Unfortunately, not, right? Because THC and CBD, their vaporization point is literally very, very close. So then you'd have to select something based on testing from wherever you get it that has lower amounts of THC to start and higher amounts of CBD because you would not be able to kind of select it out a little bit by vaporization temperature. Gotcha. And then that sort of touches on the entourage effect, right? How do you think right. about that as far as, you know, having the full spectrum of, you know, when it comes to protein, amino acids or whatever, but in this case, you know, in marijuana with all the different compounds at play? Yeah, in general, I'm very suspect of any entourage effect. Um, but having said that, there is pretty good data. I think Russo's, uh, Russo's published some of this that shows it, it actually appears to be true. Um, they've done different studies looking at pain with uh, THC or CBD present, and it appears to be slightly better. They've done studies looking at CBD in a full-spectrum extract of hemp oil versus just isolated CBD. Uh, the extraction with all the other compounds in there appears to be better. You can get by with a lower dose of CBD. Um, we know that CBD, the effects of it do, do get moderated by even a very tiny amount of THC. So there is a little interaction with those two. Um, but in general, the entourage effect, I believe, is probably real. We've got some data to show that that is true. Um, generally, with supplements, though, I'm very suspect of it because when you combine things, you're going to have two things. You're either going to have an additive effect, meaning one plus one is equal to two. Um, so they kind of stack <clears throat> on each other. Or the word that always gets used in the supplement industry is, oh, bro, these like three compounds are synergistic, right? So one plus one instead of equal three is like nine. And if you look at the research that I, I can't even really think of anything that is truly synergistic. Maybe there is some out there. Uh, most of it is if you're lucky additive, but most of it's not even additive. Most of it is just a little bit better, right? Because if it was all purely additive, I could load myself on beta alanine, take creatine, take a high dose of uh, caffeine, and each, let's say each one of those has a 2% positive effect, right? I would see a 6% increase in my performance, which is pretty massive. And the reality is we don't see that, right? So it's probably even less than an additive effect. Um, however, with natural compounds, especially when you start getting into different polyphenols, uh, there does appear to be some interactions there that do show positive data. Okay, cool, man. Now, I'd love to get into some of the potential positive effects and then also maybe some potential drawbacks of using some of these products sure. as well. Yeah, I would say positives with CBD. Uh, there is some data on anxiety. So the number one anxiety-producing thing, or definitely in the top three, is public speaking. <laughs> so they had people where they forced them to speak in public, and they gave them either a high dose of CBD before or not. 
I think it was, uh, I think they did use a placebo in a couple of those trials. It's about four of them done. And it did show that there was a beneficial effect on anxiety. Again, acute interaction. And the downside is that dosages are pretty high. And they were kind of across the board. Right? So they're anywhere from 150 milligrams. I think one study tested up to 600 milligrams. And you know, 150 to 300 milligrams is maybe kind of the sweet spot. Again, depending on a handful of studies. And that's a much higher dose than what most people will probably realize. So a lot of CBD right now is dramatically underdosed. You know, you'll see stuff like energy drink, five milligrams of CBD or 10 milligrams of CBD. And maybe for general health, maybe you can make an argument that the lower doses may be okay. But if there's something you want to particularly affect, uh, most of the dosages have to be a little bit higher. Um, there's some data on sleep. Mm, it's pretty mixed. That's normally looking at just pathologies of sleep. Um, I have noticed that people who tend to be more higher anxiety, and that's why they just can't sleep at night, uh, I've noticed that that does appear to be a little bit better for them. Um, so I've tested CBD in a full spectrum on sleep and off and on for maybe like a year and a half now. And for me personally, I find that I probably need about a 40 to 80 milligram dose to see much of an effect. And I would say I can see an effect, but it's relatively small. Uh, it's using like the, the Aura Ring and HRV and things to kind of look at that. Um, so possibly for sleep, um, if you're a healthy person, don't have a lot of anxiety, I would say maybe. Uh, there's not a lot of literature to support that. That's just my own kind of analytical end of one testing and with clients. Um, to me, like I think the biggest thing for CBD is potentially brain health and potentially maybe prophylactically beforehand or even after you would take a big whack to the head or have something called a TBI. So TBI is a traumatic brain injury. If you take a big whack to the head, what happens is you're having your brain still move around in your skull and you can end up with kind of different types of literally just shearing axons to all sorts of, of damage. And the hard part with studying it is depending on the mechanism of injury, depending on how your brain is specifically wired, like TBI is just this huge umbrella of probably a bunch of other sub things that could be going on. Uh, but there's some um, animal data where they took the animals, the poor little mice, and they gave me either a high dose of CBD, I believe in a full spectrum or not. And then they whacked them on the head and, and gave the poor little bastards TBIs. <laughs> and what they found was in the group that had the high-dose CBD, their blood-brain barrier did not open up as much. So what happens is if you have a TBI or you take a big whack to the head, uh, two main things happen. One, your blood-brain barrier can actually become permeable and, in essence, open up and allow a whole bunch of other stuff to flow into your brain that shouldn't be there, which causes a massive inflammation response. And then also your energy metabolism just kind of goes offline, especially your body's ability to use glucose in the brain. And those two things are very bad in essence and have a whole host of downstream consequences. Um, so CBD in an animal study may help prevent the blood-brain barrier from opening up possibly, so prophylactically. Uh, CBD appears to be very good at treating neuronal inflammation. It does appear to cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, so you've got kind of two mechanisms there that may directly help uh, TBIs either prophylactically or after. Uh, the direct data on that, I would say, is kind of mixed and not really been studied that much. But there's a whole host of animal data. Uh, there is some preliminary human data. There's a very interesting study from several years ago uh, looking at car accidents and people who had TBI most of the time, if you have a car accident and get a TBI, a lot of times you get admitted to the hospital. They'll do a tox screen just to see what's going on. So I did a study where they retrospectively looked at people who had a head injury from car accidents. And they looked at their tox screen to see if they were positive for THC or not. Right? Because it's one way of kind of looking at a compound that's generally considered illegal. You know, you can't really dose people with a high dose and you don't want them driving vehicles. You're not going to whack them on the skull. Right? So it makes it hard to get direct studies on it. And what they showed, I think it was over 400 people they looked at, they actually even pulled the study out over several years and looked at mortality. So at the end of the study, were you alive or were you dead? Which sounds kind of cruel, but it's what they call a hard endpoint. Right? It's very easy to figure out. You don't have to argue about you know, other indicators. 
Um, what they found was if you had a positive tox screen for THC, again, they don't know how much, they just know that it was present. Your mortality, you actually lived much longer after a TBI than if you didn't. So there is some other data that even small amounts of THC uh, may be beneficial in that process also in addition to CBD, possibly in addition to other uh, cannabinoids and terpenes which have been studied even less. That's fascinating, man. Now, as far as TBI specifically, I'd love to get your sort of hypothetical uh, situation as far as what to do on a nutrition, movement, sleep, and supplement standpoint, like in that three yeah. to five day window after a TBI, what would you do personally? Yeah. First thing I would do is bef- to me, like, so if I'm consulting with any athletes um, and they're in, you know, potentially mixed martial arts, maybe they do extreme sports, maybe they're doing American football, something where they are willingly putting themselves at risk for a uh, TBI. Uh, The first thing I would tell them is, you know, find a good clinical neurologist, meet with them beforehand, have your baselines done. So if something happens, you may even go as far as to say, hey, if something happens to me, literally, like, how soon can I get in to see you? Right? Because to me, the first thing I'm going to do, and I work with uh, Dr. Jeremy Shimo here out of his office in Minnesota. My opinion, he's one of the top probably TBI guys in the U.S., if possibly the world. Um, And... I have the luxury of I know him. I'm a faculty member with him at the Kerrigan Institute. But if something happens, I can literally text him and be like, hey, this happened. You know, when can I get in? Uh, if most people don't have that luxury. Find someone ahead of time. It's probably worth paying the money to get a good baseline and talk to him and say, hey, based on my scores and what you know, what would you recommend that I would do potentially prophylactically if something happens? You know, how soon can I get in to get an eval? Because... In the past, we used to say, okay, if you get a big whack to the head, you're light sensitive, you have all these horrible things going on, they used to be like, let's just wait. Let's let everything calm down. Let's not do anything. Now they've kind of swung the other way, and they're like, well, if we do that, yes, some of the metabolic stuff seems to be healing, but now you're actually getting worse during that entire time, right? Your brain, because of the plasticity, is getting better at being worse. The flip side is some people get a little bit too aggressive initially with treatment, and that can send someone the other opposite direction. So having said all that, what I would do personally is I actually carry, I don't know if I have them here, but they're actually in my car (laughs) and in my kiteboard bag. So I carry the HVMN, the ketone esters. Um, There are other companies that make ketone esters now. There's different types of esters. You can even get a mono ester right now. And What that is, is it tastes just god-awful like jet fuel. It is not very good. Even the new flavored ones, sorry, HVMN, doesn't taste very good. But who cares? It's just a little shot. You're going to live. Don't worry about it. Um, But what that does is we've got ketone salts and we have ketone esters. So a ketone salt is we take BHB, so beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is the main ketone that kind of flows around in your body if you're doing a ketogenic diet. And we bind it to different types of salts. Right, or what's now popular is a quad salt. So we bind it to calcium and sodium and things like that. You ingest it as a supplement, your body breaks that bond, and you have free beta hydroxybutyrate that floats around. So you can put yourself into some degree of ketosis, probably 1 to 1.5 millimolar, in about a half hour. Now, the ketone ester, which is a lot more expensive, so little vials from HVMN right now are about $35 a vial. So pretty expensive. Price will probably come down. Uh, with an ester, you can actually get super high levels of ketones within like 20 minutes. So when I've tested this on groups of you know 15 to 20 people, we'd see everyone routinely from 2 to 4.5 millimolar in like 30 minutes. So very, very high levels. So what I would do personally, uh, as soon as I would get off the water or something would happen, I would actually take ketones to put myself in a state of ketosis, uh, pretty high level, as fast as possible. My hypothesis being that Ketones have two beneficial effects. They may have direct anti-inflammatory effects on the brain, meaning they may act and interact with different signaling molecules in the brain itself. And they're providing an alternate fuel because, remember, your glucose metabolism goes offline. The brain appears to have a backup system, as does your body, of using ketones. And that system can be changed and, and fluctuate, but it doesn't ever really appear to be driven to zero. Right? So the fact that like years ago when I was talking to Dom D'Agostino about this, I was floored that like you could take Bob, who's never been in ketosis his entire life, is but looks like a couch cushion, is 50 pounds overweight, 
you could give him a ketone ester and his body would go, oh, cool, ketones. I've never seen these things in my life, but I know what to do with them. And you would see high levels of blood ketones and you could measure that they were being oxidized as fuel. Probably because that's just a ancient backup survival system. Um, so I would do that. I would probably do a fast after that, some type of um, C8 oil, and I would immediately do a ketogenic diet. Because my thought process is, now we don't know what are a lot of the beneficial effects of a ketogenic diet during that state. It's all pretty theoretical at this point. However, I haven't seen anything that, that I don't think there's a massive downside Meaning we know that ketogenic diets are safe. Like I said, look at the Charlie Foundation. People have done them for many years. I don't think there's going to be a negative downside to that. I don't know what the upside would be. But at worst case, I don't think I'm going to harm my body at all. Uh, I personally would use um, CBD in a mixed uh, extraction with other cannabinoids. Uh, high dose creatine, 10 to 20 grams per day. Higher dose fish oil, maybe curcumin. I kind of go back and forth on that. Um, and I would put myself into a high state of ketosis and just kind of monitor from there. Cool, man. I think that'll be really helpful for folks around TBI specifically. Now, as far as just general inflammation, how efficient or effective is CBD? Because I feel like that's where folks are, you know, taking it from. They're like, hey, I'm managing yeah. inflammation, but they don't really know how effective it is or what it's actually doing. So what does the research say there? I would say the research is very mixed. Um, it, inflammation is like thrown around as this word all the time. But you ask people like, well, how do you measure inflammation? Like most people don't even have a blood chemistry to even look at a very simple test like a, a CRP test, right? So high sensitive CRP or any other marker, right? Um, from what I've seen, I, I think there is some effects with uh, CBD on inflammation. For body-wide, uh, I'm not really convinced they're all that strong, um, but I do think on a neuronal side, especially in the brain, I think that there is some very good data on that. So a lot of compounds, you can find more compounds that will be more systemic than they are treating uh, the brain, right? Because the blood-brain barrier is going to push out most of those things. Um, so again, I think for neuronal health, neuron health, uh, brain health, I think CBD is going to be most beneficial for that. Um, I was at a conference, I was presenting on CBD, and to, another guy there actually was presenting on the endocannabinoid system. And at the end of the talk, I asked him, I said, hey, would you, if you were to use CBD, one, do you think it's even useful for anything? And this guy has been researching the endocannabinoid system for decades. And I said, two, what would be your number one reason of using CBD if you think it's beneficial? And he's like, yeah, I think it is beneficial for some things. And his conclusion was similar. He's like, for you know, health of the neurons, possibly anti-inflammation effects, brain aging, things of that nature. Uh, his suspect was that CBD is probably very beneficial for that. That's really interesting stuff. And then how would you sort of rank order, you know, nutrition, movement, sleep as far as that general inflammation goes? Because I just don't want people to think that, you know, CBD is some like, they just take some CBD and all their inflammation is going to go away. Like, what are the most important inputs as far as inflammation and uh, what we can do? Yeah, probably not very popular, but my, again, I don't have any direct data, but my gut feeling is that movement, I think, is number one. That's probably surprising to a lot of people. Um, if you just think about, and again, who knows if it's chicken or the egg, right? Does it causation, which way does it go? But most people, if you move really well, you tend not to have much joint achy, other kind of indirect markers of inflammation. There's one very cool study that was replicated, I believe, where they, uh, looked at the finger and they did something to cause damage to the finger, just very slight. I don't remember what they were doing, but they were causing some, some method of inducing pain in the finger. And then what they did is they gave them binoculars. So they either had the binoculars one way or the other. So they made the finger look smaller or they made the finger visually appear bigger. And what they reported was when you made the finger look smaller, the same stimulus that they used to create pain, subjects reported that it was less painful. When they made the finger look bigger, subjects reported that it was more painful. What was super cool about the study is they had a little band around it to measure swelling and inflammation. 
When the finger looked smaller, there was less inflammation and swelling. When the finger looked bigger, the finger actually had physically more inflammation and swelling in it. So I think there's a very big correlation between movement and inflammation that we're probably just barely scratching the, the surface of. Um, so I'd say do more movement, do movement that's non-painful, uh, make sure your body's working the way that it should. We do know that that will indirectly lower uh, stress levels, right? So if we lower stress, you could argue that that's probably anti-inflammatory, increasing parasympathetic tone, right? That rest and digest branch of the nervous system. Um, sleep, we know from brain health, is super high, right? Your little neurons kind of go through their own little astrocyte car wash at night and get all cleaned out and that kind of stuff. Uh, Matthew Walker's talked a lot about that. Uh, Body-wide, I would say probably still in effect, but I don't know how much. Uh, nutrition, we definitely know has an effect on it. Uh, probably the most direct and most probably controllable for most people. Um, so you can look at things of omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, um, vegetable intake, micronutrients, uh, things you want to try to avoid like trans fats. Um, I have indirectly done little experiments with people who've had joint pain and just dramatically up increased their uh, intake of fruits and vegetables. Even in like three to five weeks, a lot of their joint pain kind of resolved on its own. Who knows if that's from the intervention or just the fact of, of time, but a lot of them had it for several months before that. So, you know, maybe, uh, again, there's some anecdotal data and there's some research data to support that too. So I'd say they all work together, but nutrition, I think, is the most directly modifiable. And when I work with clients, that's usually the easiest thing they can see a connection to. Um, yeah, but I still think movement, if I were to pick one, I would actually target movement. Because I've noticed in myself is if my movement's on point and my sleep is relatively good but not perfect, I can not really be that great with my nutrition and, you know, blood chemistry, how I feel, aches and pains, all that stuff stays pretty good. Um, but if my movement starts getting really bad and I don't move in a lot, I have to be really, really vigilant with my nutrition or I tend to fall apart also. Um, so I think there's, they're, they're more coupled than what we realize. Gotcha, man. Now, anecdotally, I've heard of some cancer patients going through chemo and using CBD to increase appetite. I think we're all aware that THC, if you smoke some weed, a lot of mm -hmm. people get an increase in appetite. But do we know anything as far as CBD specifically on the appetite front and how it affects it? Uh, from what I've seen, the answer is I don't know. Uh, the data I've seen so far, which is indirect, I don't think CBD really interacts with appetite all that much. Um, again, if you look at some of the, the nausea data on, on cancer, cachexia, things of that nature, it appears to be just like old school roll joint with you know higher amounts of THC, but not ungodly high, appears to be pretty good. What's interesting about that is uh, the synthetic version, Marinol, uh, a lot of physicians you talk to don't really like to use it because they don't really find it that effective. So there may be, I think, other compounds that are interacting there also that we don't quite understand. Um, the drug industry has been super interested in this for a long time, right? Because think about obesity. Think about, oh, my gosh, we found this thing that makes someone more hungry. Oh, wait, if we can do the opposite and make someone less hungry, you know, that's a multi-billion dollar drug overnight. And they did have one called Rimobant that was, I don't know if I got through phase three trials, I think. And what it was is trying to modify those kind of same receptors. But instead of kind of turning them on, it's trying to kind of block them and turn them off. Right. So trying to make you less hungry, not more hungry. Uh, what they found was that it was relatively effective for that. The big downside was uh, risk of like suicide, suicidal thoughts, all that kind of stuff went up dramatically, and I don't believe it's ever been approved as a drug. Um, there's some, I read a couple of days ago, there's some interesting mouse studies where they have another version of that that they've tweaked the compound so that it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Their thought being, hey, maybe we can target some of these cannabinoid receptors in the body Maybe we can get this kind of reduction in appetite effect, but if we tweak the molecule so that it can't cross into the brain, maybe we can kind of reduce or eliminate some of the other uh, negative side effects that they've seen before. 
Now, I haven't seen where they've even started you know, potentially human trials or anything on that. Obviously, a ton of drugs that work really well in mice like just completely, utterly fail in humans. But maybe we will see something along those lines in the future, possibly. That's fascinating stuff. Now, both in my personal experience and anecdotally talking with heavy weed smokers, I've seen libido go both ways. So as far as lending itself to increase libido, but then it seems to be acute because after prolonged use, it seems to be quite common to impair libido in folks. So is there any research on that? I've looked at it a little bit and I I honestly can't find a whole lot. Um, A guy hit me up the other day and said he had some related to possibly increased estrogen formation and conversion. Um, I haven't seen that yet. I would say anecdotally, I kind of hear of the same thing. You know, maybe if you're reducing anxiety acutely, you know, that can maybe have some positive uh, effects or maybe there's other things going on. But yeah, I haven't seen any direct data either. And in my head, I always wonder about kind of what are the, all the other factors too, right? Because again, and you'd like totally hate to, to stereotype, and I know I have friends who definitely go against this, but people I know who smoke a lot of weed, a lot, some of them do exercise a lot, but I'd say most of them probably don't. <laughs> and I'd say the other lifestyle choices may or may not be the best. And of course, the don't send me hate mail. Yes, I know I have friends who are absolutely the exception to that by far. But anytime you're studying the compound, you have to look at what are the other uh, effects that may be happening. And again, it could just be those people were kind of that way before, right? So yeah, I'd like to see more of an uh, acute study looking at that. I've tried to find studies looking at it, even just related to testosterone, free testosterone. I'll look again, but I actually wasn't able to find a whole lot on that. Uh, Again, maybe they exist somewhere, but yeah, I couldn't find a lot of direct data. I kind of thought from how much I've heard from people that there would be more in that area. But yeah, and if you think about it, anything in performance related, there's just not that many studies. Uh, Very, very hard to study in the U.S. because it's a scheduled one drug. A lot of research is actually out of Israel and a couple other countries. Like Israel has been studying different effects of CBD, THC, cannabis for like decades now. Uh, But there's just not a ton of research out there. Hopefully, if it gets made legal, then it will be much easier to study and we'll have more data too. That's a super important point around the healthy user bias. I th- you can't you can't deny that. I mean, it's really, really important yeah. stuff. And you could say the same thing about, oh, well, people who use creatine tend to be healthier. Okay, were those people just because they're looking to add creatine to their diet, they're probably doing other healthful things. So was it the effect of adding creatine, which we've got tons of studies to show is very safe and efficacious for what it does. But again, like you said, the healthy kind of user bias. So is it those people are just kind of, already driven and we're kind of going down that path anyway, you know, so that's what makes it really hard to, to sort out. 100%. Now, before we get to where folks can track you down on the interwebs, Mike, is there anything that we didn't get to today around all this stuff that you'd like to leave the listeners with? Yeah, the a couple of things related to CBD in terms of legality. Again, I'm not an attorney. That may be changing in the U.S. So recently, the FDA did send a bunch of warning letters to company for claims that they were making. Uh, If you look on the FDA website, they have some interesting stuff that adding CBD to other foods it's not native in. I don't know how long that will last because the FDA is considering that, hey, that might not be legal. Um, It's really confusing because, like I said, Epidiolex is approved as a high-dose CBD as a pharmaceutical drug. So GW Pharmaceuticals has said they are not going after anyone in the CBD industry in terms of patent infringement. Uh, The original patent, I believe, for CBD is like many years old and I think is owned by the U.S. government, (laughs) which is crazy. So it's just a big legal quagmire. Um, And add to that the Department of Agriculture, I want to say the ag bill was a year and a half, two years ago, something like that, said that if you are growing uh, hemp, which is under 0.3% THC, that that is now regulated under the Department of Agriculture, not under the DEA or the FDA per se. So because of that, if you're under 0.3% THC, uh, that's how it was legal to sell CBD as a supplement in an extraction of a hemp oil. 
Because you take those, you extract it, and then you can have uh, standardized for CBD. So far, what I've seen is that's probably still legal because that's considered more of a, a functional food. But I, again, this is my guess that the days of just adding CBD to everything under the sun is probably going away. Um, we'll see what actually happens with that. That has both good and bad. Uh, the FDA paradoxically has cited safety concerns, even though they've approved Epidiolex in very high doses. But then they say, oh, but in this study, we did see some possible liver concerns. But yet at the end of the day, it was still approved for human consumption, albeit as a drug, which has different stipulations, medical guidance, things of that nature. Um, the second part is the quality of CBD right now is probably shitty with most products, <laughs> which I'm sure I'll get lots of hate mail for, but whatever. Um, the main reason for that is you, you have a marketplace right now that CBD is generally at a very high price point. And even people who do a very legitimate manufacturing of it, the COPS or what's called cost of products sold is actually on the lower side, meaning that purely by looking at raw materials to markup, uh, you can demand a relatively high price for it. So if you're an unscrupulous, unethical manufacturer, you're like, ah, quality control, sourcing, all these other stuff that's very expensive that does add a lot to the cost. Ah, screw it. We'll just, we'll just skip that stuff and we'll just put some green shit in a bottle and uh, we'll, we'll tell you that there's, you know, 100 milligrams of CBD in it, right? Um, and there is studies that, the, that have been done looking at the amount of THC was much higher than 0.3%. And these were done four or five years ago. Uh, there's some recent stuff done showing that the quality of CBD that was specced was not even remotely close. And I don't really trust any CBD manufacturer that's probably sprouted up in the last year or two, um, especially if they're selling it at a cheaper price. As like I said, if you go to uh, better places, so I've been fortunate to tour like uh, Charlotte's Web in, in Colorado and seen you know what they do. And it's very expensive to do all the stuff in the background. Right? You're operating in an area that has a lot of legal gray area, so your attorney fees are probably going to be pretty high. Uh, you have to source the material to make sure you're getting a nice, clean source of it. You have to test for heavy metals, make sure those are not present. Uh, they use the Charlotte's Web strain, which they have an advantage because it has high amount of CBD already in the compound and the leaves itself. But in order and to try to keep the exact same genetic strain, they will uh, sprout them and basically plant them by hand. So they're literally cloning all of them because they don't want any other foreign seeds or anything to get into that genetic strain. So now you have that cost, you have the extraction, you have to do some type of process, CO2 critical extraction is most common, and then you have to have testing, you have to have traceability. So what I tell people is probably bigger manufacturers have also a lot more to lose. So if they are cutting corners and the FDA will probably want to potentially make an example out of more bigger manufacturers and smaller ones, and they also have their own reputation, you know, they have a lot to lose. If it's, you know, Bob's Corner CBD he made in his bathtub, you know, Bob probably doesn't have a lot to lose if he gets busted. He'll, you know, cash out and maybe disappear to the Cayman Islands or something. Who knows? Um, so I tell people, probably go with a bigger manufacturer. Um, call them and ask them, like, do they have a customer service department? Like, ask questions like, where do you source your material from? Can you show me something called a COA or certificate of analysis? Like, what you say is in the bottle. Have you tested to see if that's actually in the bottle? right? Do you have traceability? Hey, here's my lot number. Can you give me the COA for this lot, right? And any company that is doing things the correct way will be more than happy to help you, right? Because they want to demonstrate that, hey, we are doing these things. These things are ungodly expensive. They add a, a lot of expense to the product, but we want to show that that's what we're actually doing to be uh, legitimate. You know, other companies will just probably won't even answer you or tell you, oh, you don't need that. Just trust us. It's like, nah, I'm I'm not going to do that. And I would say this is good advice for you know anything that you put in your body from you know any sort of supplement manufacturer too. Because um, they, they are regulated, but enforcement, yeah, not not really that that high on the list. That's really important stuff, man. Now, where can folks find what you're up to right now, your social handles and all that good stuff? Yeah, so probably best place is a website, uh, which is MikeTNelson.com. And that's probably the best place. I think you can still find me on Facebook. I don't, as a Dr. Mike T. Nelson, too. I should probably know what it is. I don't know. Uh, just search for Mike T. Nelson. I'm sure it'll, it'll pop up on there. Um, on the website, the 
best place is through the newsletter. So if you go to the very top of the website, there's a little place you can hop on the newsletter for free. Uh, most of the content I have uh, goes out uh, through that. And then if people are in the U.S., you can actually text uh, 44222 and then text the words CBD hype. So CBD H-Y-P-E. Uh, text that to 44222. And I'll send you a whole uh, slide deck of a presentation I did for the Ancestral Health Society all on CBD. And I'll actually send you a, a video of that whole lecture and stuff people can check out too. And that'll put them on the newsletter also. All right, man. I'll link to all that stuff in the show notes. And thanks so much for taking the time. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate all the good questions and everything. So thanks again. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Dr. Mike. Now, I just wanted to mention one sort of minor difference in opinion around mitigating inflammation, so reducing inflammation in the body. In Mike's opinion, exercise is the most powerful tool to do that. And in my opinion, it's actually nutrition. Now, they're both, no doubt about it, they're both really important. But in my opinion, I don't think if you're eating foods that you're overly sensitive to that you can necessarily move enough in order to mitigate the inflammatory effects of eating those foods. And so that's why I would put nutrition in front of exercise and movement when it comes to reducing inflammation. But again, both are super important. So you should be doing both anyway. Now, if you're interested in personalized one-on-one -on -one nutritional coaching or workout programming, you can click the link in the show notes below or head over to n1fitness.com forward slash coaching. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview. If you think that other folks would find it useful or helpful or learn from it, feel free to share it via email, social media, and also tag me up in the shared posts. I'd love that. You can also follow me up on Instagram at n1fitness and Marcus Sadu as well as n1fitness on Facebook. That's it for today, guys. Hope you enjoyed this interview. Thanks for listening. See ya.